by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Give to barrows, trays, and pans grace and glimmer of romance. Bring the moonlight into noon, hid in gleaming piles of stone. On the city's paved street, plant gardens lined with lilac sweet. Let spouting fountains cool the air, singing in the sun-baked square. Let statue, picture, park, and hall, ballad, flag, and festival, the past restore, the day adorn, and make each morrow a new morn. So shall the drudge in dusty frock spy behind the city clock, retinues of airy kings, skirts of angels, starry wings, his father's shining and bright fables, his children fed at heavenly tables. Tis the privilege of art thus to play its cheerful part, man and earth to acclimate and bend the exile to his fate, and, molded of one element with the days and firmament, teach him on these as stairs to climb and live on even terms with time, whilst upper life the slender rill of human sense doth overfill. Because the soul is progressive, it never quite repeats itself, but in every act attempts the production of a new and fairer whole. This appears in works both of the useful and the fine arts, if we employ the popular distinction of works according to their aim, either use or beauty. Thus, in our fine arts, not imitation, but creation is the aim. In landscapes, the painter should give the suggestion of a fairer creation than we know. The details, the prose of nature, he should omit and give us only the spirit and splendor. He should know that the landscape has beauty for his eye because it expresses a thought which is to him good. And this, because the same power which sees through his eyes is seen in that spectacle and he will come to value the expression of nature, and not nature itself, and so exalt in his copy the features that please him. He will give the gloom of gloom, and the sunshine of sunshine. In a portrait, he must inscribe the character, and not the features, and must esteem the man who sits to him as himself, only an imperfect picture or likeness of the aspiring original within. What is that abridgment and selection we observe in all spiritual activity, but itself the creative impulse? For it is the inlet of that higher illumination which teaches to convey a larger sense by simpler symbols. What is a man but nature's finer success in self-explication? What is a man but a finer and compacter landscape than the horizon figures? Nature's eclecticism? And what is his speech, his love of painting, love of nature, but a still finer success? All the weary miles and tons of space and bulk left out, and the spirit or moral of it contracted into a musical word, or the most cunning stroke of the pencil. But the artist must employ the symbols in use in his day and nation, to convey his enlarged sense to his fellow men. Thus. The new in art is always formed out of the old. The genius of the hour sets his ineffaceable seal on the work and gives it an inexpressible charm for the imagination. As far as the spiritual character of the period overpowers the artist and finds expression in his work, so far it will retain a certain grandeur and will represent to future beholders the unknown, the inevitable, the divine. No man can quite exclude this element of necessity from his labor. No man can quite emancipate himself from his age and country, or produce a model in which the education, the religion, the politics, usages, and arts of his times shall have no share. Though he were never so original, never so willful and fantastic, he cannot wipe out of his work every trace of the thoughts amidst which it grew. The very avoidance betrays the usage he avoids. 
above his will and out of his sight, he is necessitated by the air he breathes and the idea on which he and his contemporaries live and toil to share the manner of his times without knowing what that manner is. Now that which is inevitable in the work has a higher charm than individual talent can ever give, inasmuch as the artist's pen or chisel seems to have been held and guided by a gigantic hand to inscribe a line in the history of the human race. This circumstance gives a value to the Egyptian hieroglyphics, to the Indian, Chinese, and Mexican idols, however gross and shapeless. They denote the height of the human soul in that hour, and were not fantastic, but sprung from a necessity as deep as the world. Shall I now add that the whole extant portion of the plastic arts has herein its highest value as history, as a stroke drawn in the portrait of that fate, perfect and beautiful, according to whose ordinations all beings advance to their beatitude? Thus, historically viewed, it has been the office of art to educate the perception of beauty. We are immersed in beauty, but our eyes have no clear vision. It needs, by the exhibition of single traits, to assist and lead the dormant taste. We carve and paint, or we behold what is carved and painted, as students of the mystery of form. The virtue of art lies in detachment, in sequestering one object from the embarrassing variety. Until one thing comes out from the connection of things, there can be enjoyment, contemplation, but no thought. Our happiness and unhappiness are unproductive. The infant lies in a pleasing trance, but his individual character and his practical power depend on his daily progress in the separation of things and dealing with one at a time. Love and all the passions concentrate all existence around a single form. It is the habit of certain minds to give an all-excluding fullness to the object, the thought, the word they alight upon, and to make that, for the time, the deputy of the world. These are the artists, the orators, the leaders of society. The power to detach and to magnify by detaching is the essence of rhetoric in the hands of the orator and the poet. This rhetoric, or power to fix the momentary eminency of an object, so remarkable in Burke, in Byron, in Carlyle, the painter and sculptor exhibit in color and in stone. The power depends on the depth of the artist's insight of that object he contemplates. For every object has its roots in central nature and may, of course, be so exhibited for us as to represent the world. Therefore, each work of genius is the tyrant of the hour and concentrates attention on itself. For the time, it is the only thing worth naming to do that, be it a sonnet, an opera, a landscape, a statue, an oration, the plan of a temple, of a campaign, or of a voyage of discovery. Presently, we pass to some other object, which rounds itself into a whole, as did the first. For example, a well-laid garden. And nothing seems worth doing but the laying out of gardens. I should think fire the best thing in the world, if I were not acquainted with air and water and earth, for it is the right and property of all natural objects, of all genuine talents, of all native properties whatsoever, to be for their moment the top of the world. A squirrel leaping from bough to bough and making the wood but one wide tree for his pleasure fills the eye not less than a lion, is beautiful, self-sufficing, and stands then and there for nature. A good ballad draws my ear and heart whilst I listen, as much as an epic has done before. A dog drawn by a master or a litter of pigs satisfies and is a reality not less than the frescoes of Angelo. From this succession of excellent objects, we learn at last the immensity of the world, the opulence of human nature, which can run out to infinitude in any direction. 
But I also learn that what astonished and fascinated me in the first work astonished me in the second work also. That excellence of all things is one. The office of painting and sculpture seems to be merely initial. The best pictures are rude drafts of a few of the miraculous dots and lines and dyes which make up the ever-changing landscape with figures amidst which we dwell. Painting seems to be to the eye what dancing is to the limbs. When that has educated the frame to self-possession, to nimbleness, to grace, the steps of the dancing master are better forgotten. So painting teaches me the splendor of color and the expression of form, and, as I see many pictures and higher genius in the art, I see the boundless opulence of the pencil, the indifferency in which the artist stands free to choose out of the possible forms. If he can draw everything, why draw anything? And then is my eye opened to the eternal picture which nature paints in the street with moving men and children, beggars and fine ladies, draped in red and green and blue and gray, long-haired, grizzled, white-faced, black-faced, wrinkled, giant, dwarf, expanded, elfish, capped and based by heaven, earth, and sea. A gallery of sculpture teaches more austerely the same lesson. As picture teaches the coloring, so sculpture the anatomy of form. When I've seen fine statues and afterwards enter a public assembly, I understand well what he meant who said, when I have been reading Homer, all men look like giants. I too see that painting and sculpture are gymnastics of the eye, its training to the niceties and curiosities of its function. There is no statue like this living man, with his infinite advantage over all ideal sculpture of perpetual variety. What a gallery of art have I here. No mannerist made these varied groups and diverse original single figures. Here is the artist himself improvising, grim and glad, at his block. Now one thought strikes him, now another, and with each moment he alters the whole air, attitude, and expression of his clay. Away with your nonsense of oil and easels, of marble and chisels, except to open your eyes to the masteries of eternal art, they are hypocritical rubbish. The reference of all production at last to an aboriginal power explains the traits common to all works of the highest art, that they are universally intelligible, that they restore to us the simplest states of mind and are religious. Since what skill is therein shown is the reappearance of the original soul, a jet of pure light. It should produce a similar impression to that made by natural objects. In happy hours, nature appears to us one with art, art perfected, the work of genius. An individual in whom simple tastes and susceptibility to all the great human influences overpower the accidents of a local and special culture is the best critic of art. Though we travel the world over to find the beautiful, we must carry it with us or we find it not. The best of beauty is a finer charm than skill in surfaces, in outlines, or rules of art can ever teach, namely, a radiation from the work of art or human character. A wonderful expression through stone or canvas or musical sound of the deepest and simplest attributes of our nature and therefore most intelligible at last to those souls which have these attributes. In the sculptures of the Greeks, in the masonry of the Romans, and in the pictures of the Tuscan and Venetian masters, the highest charm is the universal language they speak. A confession of moral nature, of purity, love, and hope breathes from them all. <laughs>